We live in a world saturated with language. Our conceptual frameworks, the very languages with which we speak, the thoughts through which we interpret reality, and various other linguistic activities are as much a part of our world as any lived experience. Yet, the effort to describe this reality through the means of language leads to quite peculiar results. It seems to me that while language has the ability to separate, distinguish, and analyze, making sense of perhaps an insensible world, it also always falls short of truly capturing the moment. Our thoughts remain but an echo of the moment from which they arose. I got into this vein of thought today, as it's not exactly a completely new vein of thought for me, but today was put there by a talk of Terence McKenna's, from which I will play an excerpt right now. In the tradition of the West, this has been viewed classically as the fall. This is the fall into names instead of realities, into uh, constructs of reality rather than reality itself. And this has now been uh, inculcated into each and every one of us as, you know, both the glory and the, and the trauma of human existence, which is our extraordinary ability to reside in and be in language. So, for instance, you know, I've made this example before. A child lying in a crib and a hummingbird comes into the room and the child is ecstatic because this shimmering iridescence of movement and sound and attention, it's just wonderful. I mean, it is an instantaneous miracle when placed against the background of the dull wallpaper of the nursery and so forth. But then mother or nanny or someone comes in and says, it's a bird, baby, bird, bird. And this takes this linguistic piece of mosaic tile and, and places it over the miracle and glues it down with the epoxy of syntactical momentum. And from now on, the miracle is confined within the meaning of the word. And by the time a child is four or five or six, there, no light shines through. They're, they have tiled over every aspect of reality with a linguistic association that blunts it, limits it, and confines it within cultural expectation. But this doesn't mean that this world of signification is not outside, still existent, beyond the horizons, the foreshortened horizons of a culturally validated language. I thought it best to let Terence speak himself on this matter. He really does have quite, in my mind, a inspiring and really um, a great talent for describing things in a very vivid and intricate way that at the same time elucidates them. What a coincidence that the tools of language are such a potent device 
for unfolding their own limitations. Indeed, McKenna says it very well when he states that it is both the trauma and the glory of human experience that we live in a world of language. And I quite like the image of the vivid hummingbird in its many colors and liveliness. And the name bird, it's a bird being a mosaic tile epoxied onto it. That sense of a glue that freezes things up and indeed takes the life out of them. For a moment is a continuously alive and unfolding thing. It is only through linguistic objects that we create ever the idea of stillness and a singular point in time. The idea of points in time and time itself are developments of our language. And from this excerpt of McKenna's, I was reminded of a passage from Friedrich Nietzsche's The Gay Science. This is perhaps my favorite in the book, though it's really hard to pick from them. <laughs> it's really a gem. I recommend it highly. But it's certainly one that I remember. It's section 298. Sigh. I caught this insight on the way and quickly seized the rather poor words that were closest to hand to pin it down, lest it fly away again. And now it has died of these arid words and shakes and flaps in them. And I hardly know any more when I look at it how I could ever have felt so happy when I caught this bird. This image of insight as a living bird caught in the cage of words Doesn't it seem that we're always trying in our expressions through language to encapsulate fully the meaning that we wish to get across? The meaning that, as McKenna says, this entire world that every moment is deeply pregnant with. Indeed, as I'll say at other times, throughout my work and in my world of thought. This very life itself is at its core and in its essence a phenomenon of meaning. And that's not just my own idea, as I think should be plain. This is something that continuously perturbs and engages me, continuously throws me into despair, yet also great exultation. When I focus in on what I consider to be the work of semiotics, I think of it as a discipline or a realm of thought that deeply explores the implications and the ways in which this array of meaning in language takes place. It is truly the theory of signs, and thus it must ultimately fall short in fully encapsulating all of reality. And yet, the more clearly we can understand the more familiar we can become with the territory of language, perhaps the better we can understand language's limits. Through this negative revelation, uh, through this gestalt of putting language and signs, um, but particularly language, in the foreground, and then we do the gestalt shift 
to look at what was the background. What is typically the background in our language-saturated existences? Through practices such as meditation, deep immersion in nature, for some people achieved through psychedelic drugs, an engagement with the ineffable area of reality. What McKenna calls the felt immediacy of present experience. The root of all life. Meaning is indeed present in all that we do and seems often to be best expressed and yet most stunted and even killed through the artifacts of language. I suppose this is a bit of a fragment of a thought, this little video. As perhaps all of our efforts to encapsulate anything through language are. Could it be more complete? Or could it be no less so? <laughs> I will close with a reading from the Zhuangzi, a passage that I found relevant as well. Let's see what you think about that. Duke Huan was in his hall reading a book. The wheelwright, Pien, who was in the yard below chiseling a wheel, laid down his mallet and chisel, stepped up into the hall, and said to Duke Huan, This book your grace is reading, may I venture to ask whose words are in it? The words of the sages, said the duke. Are the sages still alive? Dead long ago, said the duke. In that case, what you are reading there is nothing but the chaff and dregs of the men of old. <laughs> Since when does a wheelwright have permission to comment on the books I read, said Duke Juan. If you have some explanation, well and good. If not, it's your life. Wheelwright Pien said, I look at it from the point of view of my own work. When I chisel a wheel, if the blows of the mallet are too gentle, the chisel slides and won't take hold. But if they're too hard, it bites in and won't budge. Not too gentle, not too hard. You can get it in your hand and feel it in your mind. You can't put it into words, and yet there's a knack to it somehow. I can't teach it to my son, and he can't learn it from me. So I've gone along for 70 years, and at my age, I'm still chiseling wheels. When the men of old died, they took with them the things that couldn't be handed down. So what you are reading there must be nothing but the chaff and dregs of the men of old. <laughs> An aspect of that passage that stands out to me is this idea of a perfectly round wheel. And the attempt to describe too soft or too hard of chisel blows makes me think of making a kind of edgy or polygonal shape that's anything but a circle. Whereas the entering into that perfect nonlinear circular shape is something that can only be felt out and never truly taught through language. So I welcome you to join in further discussion on this, unless of course you find yourself happier resting in silence and the immediacy of felt experience. <laughs> uh, join in the comments below if you'd like, and I invite you to subscribe to this channel, take a look at the Philosophizing with a Hammer blog, maybe peruse some of my workshops, and in all of your endeavors, remain curious, but not overly fascinated.
perhaps.